You may be seated. As you're being seated, would you take a copy of God's Word and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 13. Last week, I mentioned to you that we were going to begin a brand new series in the next several Sundays. And as I began to prepare Monday morning uh, and had really, uh, in my quiet time, really, God just really began to speak to my heart early Monday morning, about 5.30 or so, and uh, came across some scripture in 2 Corinthians. I'm in that book in my quiet time right now. And God just made it abundantly clear and kind of wrecked my whole thought process of where I was heading in Acts chapter 8. And so I kind of looked at Acts chapter 8 when I got here because I was a little stubborn and thought I was really going to go that direction. And about, about 45 minutes in, I, I, I walk into Chris and I said, well, not going to do Acts chapter 8. I'm tired of fighting it. We're going to go to, to uh, this series uh, and we need to, and we want to jump into it. And so over the next four Sundays, we're going to kind of dive into this idea of living pure in an impure world. This morning, we're going to do a flyover about that, about the standard of purity, what God has said for us in Scripture. The next Sunday, we're going to dive and talk about uh, marriage and homosexuality and gender and what, what that means for us based on this standard of living pure in an impure world and how we can proclaim that message and what that means for us as the church. The next Sunday, we're going to talk about pornography. Uh, I've done some research a little bit this week, and the statistics are just absolutely stunning. It's something that we as a church must talk about. We must engage and dialogue about. Some of you that have young children, some parents have asked me, how are you going to handle it? I have young children too. So we will handle it with grace. We will handle it carefully. But I would encourage you, if you have young children, this is a conversation you need to already be talking about. All right? This is something, when I quote statistics to you that I have learned and read about this week, it will blow your mind. Let me just share this stat with you. I I'm, I'm, hope I remember this correctly. By the time your child that lives right now reaches the age of 18, if they are a male, over 90% of those males will have been exposed to hardcore pornography by the time they're 18 years old. 90%. The number for females is a little bit lower. I don't remember the exact number. I want to say it's 70%, somewhere around there, but I'm not exactly sure. It's a high number. And so we've got to talk about this and have a conversation about pornography, much less about adults, because we know the number is high as well. And so we're going to do several things. We're going to talk about pornography. We're going to talk about how you can be set free from pornography. We're going to talk about, give you some resources for adults on how to deal with those kinds of issues. And then moms and dads, uh, adults, on that Sunday night at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a technology summit um, we're going to try to give as much information to you about how you can help your teenager, and specifically teenager and young uh, preteen, navigate these waters that are so dangerous today. So we want to be very practical about that. Chris Robbins and Charlie Morgan are putting together a lot of resources, uh, how we can help and present those to you. Um, some Bible studies, um, scripture articles, books, all kinds of things we're putting together to try to help us address this issue. Because it's not, it's not when we talk about readily, we hear that word and we're like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. We need to talk about it. And we are. Uh, and then the last one we're going to talk about is alcohol. We're going to dive into the subject. What is God's words about alcohol? And how do we talk about that? How do we talk about it with our kids? How, we, how do we live in our society? We're often known, Baptists are known as, uh, uh, as uh, teetotalers, it's often said, back in the, in the early days of Southern Baptist life. Um, and I love this. I talked to Andy Stoddard uh, when he was here at Asbury. And uh, we were joking one day. And he said, man, he said, our church has grown. And I said, that's awesome. He said, man, and, and a lot of our growth, he said, and he was being cute and tongue in cheek. He said, man, we just had a lot of Baptist deacons that wanted to drink. So they, they're part of our church. And uh, you can laugh. That's good. It's okay. He was laughing. We laughed together. And, uh, and so we want to talk about what does the Bible say about it? What are we supposed to know? How do we live in this day and age in which we live in? And, and so we're going to talk about that. And so I want you to know that on the front side, there's a lot of me that's a little nervous. And, and I told my wife, I said, if I'm still pastoring a month, um, I'll know that my people really believe that I'm their shepherd. If I'm not, then we'll know, maybe not, because these are, these are controversial subjects, or at least they can be, but here's what I believe. I don't think they're that controversial at all, just to be honest with you. I think God's Word addresses all of these and how we can deal with them, how we can help each other, how we can help our children and our families to protect our families. And so I'm excited. I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm passionate about this series, and I, I think it's one of the most important that we'll address, and we can address a lot of other issues too. We're just going to grab these three, and maybe down the road we'll come back and grab a couple of others that we we might call hot buttons in our society. How do we talk about these issues? And perhaps we'll grab those. Uh, then March the 20th, we'll have the Lord's Supper together. And then March the 27th is Easter Sunday. So we'll be right there on Easter Sunday. And then April the 3rd, we'll kick off a series on prayer for April and May. So it's going to be a powerful, powerful rest of the wintertime and into the spring together. So impure and impure world. I don't think I have to spend a whole lot of time, do I, 
uh, having to convince you that we live in an impure world, right? Does anybody need convincing that we live in an impure world, right? It, you, it doesn't take long. You can just watch a commercial. You can watch a Super Bowl halftime show. You can, you can look on the internet. You can listen to the radio. You can read things. We live in an ever-growing, impure world. And so the question is, how are we as believers to then live pure when we are surrounded by impurity? It's everywhere. I've grown convicted, and God really confirmed it in the last several weeks together. As a matter of fact, when Chris and I went to a conference a couple of weeks back, and, and no lie, we had talked about these spe- three specific topics, Chris. You can be my witness. These three specific messages that we're going to talk about, and, and the, the pastor that was there said he had just done a series uh, on these three exact topics. Chris and I almost laughed ourselves out of the chair and said, like, okay, well, Lord, we hear you. Um, we want to address these issues. And so just a lot of confirmation that we needed to talk about these particular issues. Seeing from God's perspective and, and God's desire for us as his people is that we can be a people that God can use in extraordinary and powerful ways But before he can use us, because I think all of us have that desire, at least I hope that you do, but before that can happen, we have to be a pure people through whom God can move in powerful ways because God cannot move through impure people in the way that he can a pure church. So we want to be purified by the Lord. That is the challenge. We want to be a part of 1 Peter 2 verse 9, which says this, but you are talking about us, the church, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God's description of us as a church and us as individuals, a holy priest, a royal priesthood, a a chosen race, a, a holy nation, God's own possession. Did you know that sometimes people say, well, I just don't know about me. I'm not, I'm not really anything great. You are, you're God's own possession. That's what the standard that God has called us to be, our calling of who we are in Christ. The question is, are we living and walking in that particular calling? And and that calling and who God says we are is not to make us arrogant. It's not to make us, well, that's right, I'm chosen. I'm a royal priesthood, that's right. I'm a a Christian, I'm a child of God. That can create arrogance in us. That's not what this is intended to do, is it? Instead, here's why we want to recognize who we are, so that, what does that mean? There's a reason so that we may declare to a dark world that grows ever darker, that grows ever more cloudy, that grows ever more distinctly opposed to the things of God, that we are called to be light. D.L. Moody said this statement, it is a great deal better to live a holy life than to talk about it. Lighthouses do not ring bells and fire cannons to call attention to their shining. They simply shine. That's our calling. To be a pure body of believers that God can move through in a powerful way. So we ask these questions. Why must we be pure? How do we do do that considering we live in an impure way? And what are the results of us living a pure life. So let me say, the foundation we lay today will help the rest of the three Sundays. And, and I know the next three Sundays, are, there's some things going on on the weekends and spring breaks in the middle of all that. I want to encourage you, if you are here on that Sunday and you get in really late on Saturday night, I want to encourage you, be here on Sunday morning. I'm hoping these topics will be hot enough you'll want to hear what the preacher has to say about it and you'll be in church on Sunday, even during spring break Sundays, all right? So if not, if you miss it, I want to encourage you to check it out online, listen to it, because I think these are going to be so very important. Let's talk about this, looking at the scripture from God's word. Let me invite you to stand in the honor of reading God's word. We're going to read one verse together, and then we'll read 1 Peter. The theme verse of our four Sundays together, here it is, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 7. Let us, let's read this together, uh, and here's what it says. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Good, that was really excited right there reading. Let's, let's read it together like it's exciting, not like it's drudgery, all right? Let's read it together. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Another translation says, but to live holy lives. That's our calling. 
Let's dive in and see what Peter has to say in verse number 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. If you address as the Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of the lamb unblemished and the spotless, the blood of Christ. For he, Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. God, would you speak to us powerfully, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. You take your outline out there and let's look at four or five key things we're gonna talk about this morning that are powerful words. Number one, let's talk about this and you can follow along on your iPad or your phone as well. It's all there as well. The challenge of our calling. The challenge of our calling. We've already mentioned a little bit. Jesus talked about it to his disciples about the challenge of our calling when he says we are called to be in the world but not of the world. Our challenge as believers is to be in the world, you can grab that next one, but not of the world. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, John kind of talks about and quotes the words of Jesus in John chapter 17 in verses 13 to 19. Let's just see what Jesus says quickly. It says this, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that you may have joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I, Jesus says, am not of the world. And here's what Jesus' prayer is for us. Listen to this. I do not ask you to take them out of the world but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves may also be sanctified in truth. Now here's the challenge of our calling. In generations gone by, centuries ago, we found things like this, the reaction to this kind of scripture. Well, I need to be pure in an impure world, so therefore I will remove myself from the world and, and exclude my, and go and live in isolation. Because I can't be pure in the middle of impurity. In this day and age, those times, monasteries were founded because, well, I, I know I can't live in isolation. That, we figured out that wasn't biblical. So we'll just pull away from the world and all of its impurities and live with only pure people. Of course, we also found out that didn't work either because there are none pure but Jesus Christ alone. And if all the believers pull themselves out, which can sometimes happen in modern day world, and that is the church, we huddle together, we almost hide together, we want, we want to keep our kids away from every possible thing known to man and not have any kind of relationships or friendships with the impure world, and mine's saved, and that's good, and that's all that matters. It's never what God intended. You see, there is a challenge of our calling to be a believers that live in the world as a part of the world, but the world is not a part of us. The problem is, in our lives and in our churches, too often, the world has become a part of us and we don't know it. It's so sly, it's so easy for it to take place, and it happens over sometimes generations as what was, what was once a standard has now become something that has slid down the road. Charles Swindoll says this statement, the Christian solution to the problem of holy living in an unholy world is not isolation, watch this, but insulation. That's a good word, isn't it? It's not about isolation, it's insulation. In other words, you know, in your house, you have insulation. 
You have things that keep the outside air from coming in. Now, it's interesting to note that some studies have been done, and I'm not a builder and all that kind of stuff. You can talk to builder people, but, but there's the styrofoam stuff that you can put in your walls that harden. And what's interesting to note is, is that some people have said, and I don't, again, know the research, and I'd love to have that in my walls. That would be great because it's really great and energy efficient. But sometimes the air becomes so dead that the air stays stagnant inside a home. In other words, a house that we used to call would, would kind of like a sieve. I lived in one of those. It was built in 1971, the past storm I moved from Alabama. Man, you could just put your hand up by the door and it just feel the cold air blowing in. I mean, just blowing in like a, like a tornado. The windows, around the windows, it, they had storms, screen windows. That didn't work any good either. Just, I mean, it's like it came through the walls. What, what they found out was is that there needs to be some, a little bit of porous in those walls, if you will, so that the air can come in and come out to some extent. It's kind of like our lives in the church, isn't it? Think about it. If we can put insulation in and keep the whole world out, which to some extent we want to be able to do that, but, but not to the extent that we, we isolate ourselves, we simply insulate ourselves. Like on a cold day, you put a jacket on, you go out of the world, my, our prayer is why we come to Sundays and Wednesdays and why these times are so critical is here's why. We want to give you the insulation to put on your life so that when you walk out and encounter an impure world tomorrow or even this afternoon, you are equipped to deal with that impure world. So the challenge of our calling, it's very, very real. Notice the second thing. We have to, to talk about the standard. Cherish the standard that has been set. Now, let's be very clear about this standard, church family. I'm going to be crystal, crystal clear. If we don't know this standard, then the rest of what we talk about over the next three Sundays will not make sense. This standard is clear. It is precise. It is unquestionable. It is unwaverable. There is no, I'm not sure if it's gray. It is black and white right before us. Cherish the standard that's been set before us. And so he says, what is our standard? Our standard is God. It is our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is through the Holy Spirit that we know what our standard is. And the standard is, and Peter quotes in the Old Testament from the book of Leviticus, be holy as I am holy. Some scriptures you can look at later. I just had to fly through these. But Leviticus chapter 11, chapter 19, chapter 20, chapter 19 and 20, there's like 20-something verses where this statement is made, I have called you out to be my people. Be holy as I am holy. Let's flip to 19, verse 1 and 2. Uh, flip over to the next one, if you will. Um, Michael, if you will. Go ahead, one more, if you will. Listen to what it says here. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for the Lord your God am holy. Thus you are to be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. That's our standard. That's our calling. We need to cherish this standard to understand what it means. Now, there's two Greek words in the New Testament that talk about these words of holiness or purity. The words are katharos and hagios. These words mean to be pure, clean, innocent, undefiled, free from corruption or sin and guilt. The word hagios, the word that we translate holy most of the time, means to be set apart for God, exclusively His, pure and sinless, upright and Holy. This idea of holiness includes a specific moral sense of separation from evil and a dedication to a right way of living. It produces in us a loving conformity to, to God's command, which ultimately then produces in us what? His character. And in this case, this character, his purity and his holiness. That's why we call it holy matrimony, right? Right? A husband and a wife separating themselves from their families they once had. Because the Bible says, leave that family and cleave to one another. It's the idea of setting apart a new family to become one. So it's the two words, the word pure and impure. We see the word pure in your outline equals this. It equals our Savior. He alone is pure. And then we are called to be his saints. Flip on the next one, Michael, if you will. Oh, there it is. And then the, the second one is this, impure equals Satan and the sinner. So we see what is pure, only Christ alone and his saints, and then those that are impure of Satan and the sinner. Don't know where you are, but listen, just want to tell you what the Word of God says. You are one of two people this morning. You are on the team of one of two people this morning. 
If you are a child of God, you are called a saint and God is your father and Jesus is your savior and you are declared pure. If you do not know Christ as Savior and as Lord, then your father is that of Satan. When we say that, people go, oh, no, 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 I would never worship Satan. But listen, if you don't worship Jesus, then the only other alternative is to follow Satan. And you are still a sinner. But there is great, great news if you are. Would you hang on that minute? I want that to just sit in your mind a moment. We'll come back and talk about how you can move from being a sinner to a saint. And it's not anything that you do. It's understanding what God has done on your behalf. So child of God, do you realize you are called a saint, a holy one? Now, if we look to our spouse and ask the question, am I a saint? We might not get the answer we're hoping for. Children, you probably, teenagers, don't need to look at your mom and dad and ask, am I a saint? Now, grandparents, looking at your grandchildren, they are, of course, nothing but saints, right? Because your view has gotten very foggy. I don't know what happens to grandparents. You just get, the view gets foggy. The meanness melts away. The question is, you need to ask and identify, who are you this morning? According to that standard. Now, this standard's high. You hear that and you're going, I don't know about you, but I hear that. And it says, be holy as I am holy. Holy cow. No pun intended. Holy cow, how is that going to happen? I mean, that is a high, high standard. He says, be like me in my holiness. Folks, God is perfectly holy. There has never been a thought of sin. There is no sin in him. He won't allow sin into his presence. God is perfection, unblemished, white, perfect, holy, righteous, and just. That is our God. He is that great of a God, yet he says, you are to be like me. And I hear that and I go, oh no, I, I can't do that. Which is we'll find in a moment is the exact reaction we should have. But see, we need to understand three words about, and these are big, three big theological words. I want you to grab them for just a moment to help us understand what, it mean, what he means by this. To be holy like him, first of all, is the word Salvation. It means that I, I have been saved or I'm going to get saved today, maybe, prayerfully. We are or have been saved. The next word is the word sanctification. We just saw it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, which is we are being saved. Okay? It means the idea that God is in the process of transforming us to become into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, the scripture tells us, that we are constantly, every day, being saved more and more and more. The more we yield ourselves to him, the more he makes us like himself. To get us to the final stage when we will truly be holy as he is holy. Glorification, which means when we land on heaven's shore, then we will be saved completely. We will be saved. Now, someone say, well, no, you know, I'm not saved now. No, you are. If you have salvation, you have been saved. But then there's a process which, which helps us understand salvation is not a fire insurance ticket. Right? Because we understand the process of sanctification is we don't just stay over here and say, oh, I got my fire insurance ticket. I'm going to go to heaven. No, no. But I'm saved because then God is sanctifying me. He is making me holy and pure like his son Jesus so that when I get to the point of glorification, I'm ready to go to heaven and I'm more like Jesus than I'm more like me. And that's a good thing, by the way, isn't it? We don't want to be more like ourselves. Good night. If you know yourself, hello. Now, not, no, not everybody knows. Even your spouse doesn't know everything that you think. And let's be really frank and honest, church family. We're going to really get deep here over these next couple of weeks together. If you don't want anybody to know you, they won't know you. I've been friends. I've had mentors, people that were close to me, and they didn't let me into where they were. And they were struggling with some of these issues we're going to talk about. As a result, their lives have been completely destroyed. See, I can, I, but here's the deal. He can fool me. You can fool your friends and your spouse. But listen to me carefully. There's one person you cannot fool, and that is God Almighty. He is holy. We're called to be holy. So 
at the end of each of these points quickly, here's what we see. Something it should create in us. And here's what it should create in us. A deep dependence on the Lord. Oh God, when I see your standard, I know I can't live up to it. Which then leads us to the place of getting on our knees and saying, God, if you don't help me, I will never live to the standard. Oh God, please help me. See, God is not interested in your independence. God is interested in your dependence. God, I cannot do this without you. God, I cannot be who you called me to be without you. Notice the second thing, or the third thing, conduct ourselves according to the standard. Conduct our lives in such a way that we live according to the standard. Verses 13 and 14 give us four quick bullet points. A lot here. I just have to take time to read it later. I'll go ahead and put it on the, on the website and I hope you'll take time to read it. I'm sure thousands of you will, but I hope that you'll take time to do that because it's, it's good stuff, but there's just not a tough time to cover all of it. Here's what it says. First of all, control your minds. Control your minds. Gird up your mind, the Bible says, given the illustration of pulling up a tunic, if you will, getting ready to run somewhere. It referred to, to tying something down in preparation for certain kinds of actions. Here we are encouraged to pull up the mind of our lives, our minds, to say, Lord, I want the mind of Christ. Reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in my quiet time, listen to what it says, verse 5. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. By the way, that is the impurity of the world. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're praying, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have, watch this, the mind of Christ. Did you know you have the mind of Christ in you? Did you know that? You have the mind of Christ in you. So control our minds. Folks, here's the deal. The battle is fought and lost and won in the mind. It is not in your actions. It is not in your deeds. It is won or lost right here between your two earlobes. So here's the question. Are you and I daily taking on and asking for the mind of Christ in you? Secondly, continue to be sober. Continue to be sober. Some would say, well, you mean this means not to be intoxicated? That's exactly what it means. But beyond that, of just not being intoxicated, that idea of sober means that you are sharp, that you are prepared, that you are aware, that you are ready for action. See, sometimes we get lured to sleep. We begin to think, well, it's not a big deal. My kids will be safe. I don't have to worry about them. They're really good kids. Don't be necessarily worried as much about them as the kids they're exposed to. And you got to prepare them and equip them, watch this, to continue to be sober, to be aware that there's going to come a time, students, guys, that somebody's going to text you a picture. Watch, listen to me. I want, I want your attention. This is critical for you guys. And I hope you'll be here every Sunday because these are going to be so crucial for you in your life and adults as well. That we equip you to know what do you do when somebody texts you a picture of something inappropriate? What do you do with it? How do you handle that? Moms and dads, have you had that kind of conversation? Whoa, I hadn't had that kind of conversation. We're going to. God, God's teaching me through this whole process too. So that we are, we are sobered up, right? It's like a, I hope this is like a good cup of coffee to sober some of us up to recognize and realize, folks, we are living in dangerous days. And there is a battle on for the soul of every believer in this room. Now, Satan cannot get your soul, but he can make us ineffective and impure and of no value to the world. But God's desire and God's calling. And oh God, would you make us pure people who are aware, who are saying, God, give me your mind. God, make me sober and aware of all of the sway of sin, the slippery slope of sin, the smokescreen of sin, the seduction of sin that is so relevant and prevalent in our lives. The third one, consistently fix your hope. I love this. On what? Grace. Grace. Now, the grace he's referring to is the, the coming of Christ and, and heaven. But in the short term, we all need grace. Because we're all going to miss the boat. We're going to mess up. We're going to need grace. We're going to sing about the, in our invitation time about that amazing grace. 
We need grace. And in this idea of grace, we have to be reminded that you and I were not made for here. We were made for eternity. 1 John 3, 3 says, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So here's the deal, folks. As I realize and recognize I am not made for this world, this world is not my home, and the things that we get stressed out about and upset about, if we will fix our eyes and our hope on Jesus, and we see the end goal in mind, we will be reminded that we are to purify ourselves, to be like him. Fourthly, not only consistently fix your hope on grace, conform no longer. We know this verse, Romans 12, 1 and 2, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The word conform means to squeeze into the mold. Folks, listen to me. Moms and dads in particular, listen to me. Listen to my heart. There is a battle on for you to conform to what everybody else is doing, what their kids are doing. Teenagers, listen to me. Your moms and dads have a hard, hard job. You came with no manual. You came with no instructions other than the word of God because you're all unique and different. And to parent you, boys and girls, sometimes is a hot mess. It is. Moms, teenagers, you would say, my mom and dad sometimes are a hot mess. They didn't come with instruction manuals. We didn't either. You're right. But moms and dads, there is, this, there is this powerful sway of the enemy to conform your students to that of their friends. And we want to declare that I'm not being conformed. I'm independent and I want to be not like everybody else, which in the reality is I want to be like everybody else. But now moms and dads, us, we think we're, 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 we're uh, away from that. Look at all the stuff that is yanking our kids' attention far away from the gospel. And I'm going to bring it down and get real real with you, Okay. 20 years ago, Sunday was a sacred day. Listen to me. And there is pressure, constant pressure for you to make sure your kids are going to be the best, the brightest, and the greatest. And will grab all kinds of things to grab and conform to the standards of the world. And here's my question to you, mom and dad. Here it is. Are you more concerned about them conforming to the standards of the world? Are you more concerned about making certain that you are raising pure men and women of God? Woo, I wish I was at Mount Vernon. That was a good word right there. That hurts. That's a true statement, moms and dads. And I don't say that out of you. I'm saying that to me. Because I want to conform. I want my kids to be like everybody else and not to stand out. I don't want my kids to have to hear, oh, you do that because you're the preacher's kids. We hear that. That stings. I want to be like everybody else. But listen to me. My calling is not to make them like everybody else. My call is to help them become like Jesus. And it's your call too, moms and dads. And that's not going to be easy. And that's going to be hard. And there'll be people even who claim the name of Christ that will say to you, you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to take them here. You've got to take them there. My question is, are you taking them to Jesus? Into the place where they can learn and be engaged and be equipped and be able to fight against the battle because Satan wants the soul of your student and your child and even of you. Do you get it? Do you, you catch the intensity? It's a battle. And a battle requires intensity. You're not going to see me sitting over the stool going, well, let's be prepared for battle. I'm not following somebody like that into battle. I'll just be honest with you. I'll say, hey, good luck. I'm going to grab my gun and my Uzi. We're going out the door and good luck. I don't feel very safe. Hey, we got to be passionate about this. We're passionate about everything else. Why in heaven's name am I not passionate about the holiness and the purity of God in my life? I'm asking me. Let me, you can amen me on my point to me. It should create in us a desire to obey the Lord. That's what that conduct of that standard to remind ourselves. According to that standard, she created a desire in us to obey the Lord. Notice the, the fourth one. We've got to move quickly, these last two quickly. Consider the consequence or the importance, if you will, of the standard. Now, some of you are school teachers, and you'll, you'll get what I'm talking about here just right off the bat. When I was in junior high school and elementary school, we had fear and reverence for adults. 
school teachers, principals, you know, you know what I'm talking about here, don't you? You got it. The idea of a, 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 a teenager going toe-to-toe, nose-to-nose with a teacher and telling him what they thought. We'd rather die, because here's why. Because coach bigger than life with a wooden something was going to light your hiney and it would probably come off the ground if you talked to a teacher like that. How many of you got that blessed experience in your life? Raise your hand. Look around, teenagers. Look around. How many of you teenagers don't even have never got a spanking at school? Raise your hand, teenagers. Raise your hand. Need I say any more? Right? I'm, I'm not advocating, Dr. Dillon, we go back to spanking children. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm going to beat mine at home like they need, and that's good. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Or somebody calls DHS. Here, here's the deal. It's not about that. Here, here's what we've lost. Reverence and awe, listen, and fear of God. Now listen to me. I preach about it all the time, about the love and the mercy of God. But I want to create another balance and remind you there is also the fear of God that we should have, that we have lost in our world. We have lost it, not only in the world, we have lost it in the church so that we can come into the presence of God and yawn and offend God and sin against God as if it doesn't matter and who cares. And here Peter reminds the church in these days, hey, be reminded of the fear of your heavenly Father. Now we're talking about a fear where you are scared of God because God calls us to be his friend. God calls us his child. But the only thing I can compare it to is I promise you, I had a holy fear of William Leon Eubank Jr. And even when I was 20 and 30 and 35 years old, here's what my daddy would say. Go ahead, try it. See what happens. You think your daddy's an old man you can take me? Come right on. I never did. (laughs) I knew better. You know why? Your mom's not knocking you because mom's, but my mom, man, we were with her all day. She stayed home mom and she, and I, she knows I would say this. She, she, a lot of this. But when daddy came home, all that did this right here. Whoop. It stopped. There was no more. Made my mama so mad. Oh my goodness. Some of you mamas know what I'm talking about. Made her so mad. Why is it? Because mama couldn't hit as hard as daddy could. Mama would grab brushes and sticks and switches and whatever she'd grab a hold of, and she'd go to swinging, right? Now, I never told her it didn't hurt, and my stupid brothers did. They, oh, that didn't hurt. Oh, that was a mistake. Don't say that. I learned. I took my lickings and act like it killed me. I, man, I could put on a show and be as dramatic as anybody I've ever met. I thought I was mortally wounded because I knew if I didn't, if Daddy got home, I was going to get another one. You get the idea, folks, we have lost the fear and the reverence of God. And so here's my prayer. If we're going to live to the standard of God and be pure and holy as he is holy, we must see him as pure and holy and powerful. And there is coming a day, dear church, and this is a powerful word for me. We are going to stand and account for how we've lived our lives. And we can ignore that day's coming. We can pretend that day's not coming. We can act like it's not coming. But folks, listen to me. The day is coming. Now, I will not stand before him as a judge that is about to sentence me to death or life. I'm simply going to stand before him as my judge because he will determine the rewards for which I will receive. How I'll live my life. Consider the consequence of the standard. It creates in us a holy reverence for the Lord. Or it should. Oh, so many scriptures here I don't have time to get to. I pray, church, you'll read these later. They're so, these are such powerful words. And they're not my words. They're God's words. Call, call to memory the cost of the standard. When the enticement of sin knocks at your door and at mine. And here's what I know, too, by the way, church. Go, go, just get ready for it. I've already asked people to be praying for me about this series. Because here's what I know. This afternoon and tomorrow morning, you know who's going to be knocking on the preacher's door? Satan. These are topics he doesn't want us to talk about. He'd rather us keep it in the darkness and not worry about somebody being embarrassed or worrying about somebody. Satan won't be happy about us grabbing these topics and he won't be happy about you listening about purity because as long as you're impure, he has control over you. 
call to memory the cost of the standard. Three things quickly as we close this morning. Here it is. The futile, the futile ways of our past. Before you found Christ, we were living a futile life. Now, some of you that are children, got accepted Christ as children, we don't quite get this as much. Those of you who have found Christ as adults, you get this a lot more. These that were finding Christ were many adults who had lived the ways of the Gentiles, the ways of worshiping false gods, the ways of living an immoral lifestyle, a pagan lifestyle. And he said, God has saved you and called you out of that way of living. So here's the question. Are we still living lost or are we living saved? There's a difference. Notice the second thing, the fortune it cost him. The word here is the word redeemed. The word to purchase, the word to buy back. Folks, be reminded the fact that we were redeemed, how? By the blood of the lamb. It cost God the Father and Jesus the Son everything. It cost the shedding of blood. He didn't redeem us with gold and silver that will fluctuate in cost. And one day gold cost $1,500 an ounce. And last two years ago it cost $500 an ounce. It doesn't matter the cost. It doesn't matter what is happening about perishable things. He has redeemed us with that which is imperishable, the blood of Jesus Christ. I tell our group Wednesday night, I hope I never stop preaching about the blood of Jesus. I'm going to tell you why, because we stop preaching about that. We forget the cost and the price that was paid for your salvation and for mine. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And by the way, too, this was not some backup plan. God didn't go, oh my goodness. Gabriel, did you see what Adam just did? All right, let's call emergency conference. Let's get God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let's get the angels together. What are we going to do? There was just no emergency plan. This was no backup plan. This was not plan B. God, it says here in Scripture, had foreordained before the beginning of the world that his son would die. For the third thing, the focus was for you. Boy, walk out here this morning knowing this, that the focus of God is on you and on me. How do I know that? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Plug your name in there. Brad Eubank, that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him. If Brad would believe in him, he would not have to perish, but Brad could have eternal life. And I don't have to earn it. I don't have to deserve it. I just need to be convicted of my need for Jesus. I need to admit to him that I'm a sinner. I've got to ask him to forgive me of all of my sins. I've got to believe that he is the son of the living God. Confess him as my savior. Commit my life to him as Lord, as the boss of my life. And here's the great news. I simply then receive the gift of salvation for free. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't redeem yourself. I don't care how nice you are, how moral you are, how good you are, how what a good church person you are. It does not matter. You must simply receive the gift of salvation and recognize the gift is for you. Isaiah 43, 1 through 4 remind us that God says we are honored and precious in his sight and he loves us. Which gets to the last point as we come to the time of invitation. <clears throat> And by the way, it creates in us that last one, a love for the Lord. A great love for the Lord that she created in us. Notice the last. The standard calls us to be his sanctuary. The standard calls us to be a sanctuary. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, listen to what it says here. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Back up that scripture, if you will, there. Who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Why? For you have been bought with a price. Do we realize, do we recognize that you and I have been bought with a price? And my response, the only thing I can do for him because I cannot buy it or earn it, my only way to give back to a God who has everything is to give him my life and recognize that I am not my own. We live in a world that's all about numero uno. It's all about me. And that's crept in churches over the last generation or more. 
Church is all about me, my desires, my wants, what I like. Folks, it's not about us. It is all about God and being his temple, his sanctuary, the place where his glory resides. And listen, though I love to be reverent in God's sanctuary, and I was raised that way, listen to me. This is not God's sanctuary. You are, and so am I. Sometimes we treat a building, a church, more reverent than we treat our own temple of God sometimes. Ooh, that stinks. Reminds me of that old chorus. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. A modern day version of passion sings, give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you. To know and follow hard after you, to grow as your disciple and your truth. The world is empty, pale, and pure compared to knowing you, my Lord. Lead me on and I will run after you. Oh, dear church, would you hear the call of God this morning to live pure in an impure world? Can it be done? The answer is unequivocally yes. Is it easy? No. There is a struggle. But that struggle should create a dependence upon us. And as we remember these thoughts this morning, we call to mind his standard in several ways. To cherish that standard, to conduct ourselves according to that standard, to consider the consequences of that standard, to call to memory the cost of of the standard. What does God have for you this morning? Here's what I know as we come to a time of invitation. Here's what I know. God has a response for every single one of us in this room. And so I would like to invite us to bow our heads and close our eyes and consider for just a moment before we sing this incredible song, Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace,